In the world of electronics and electricity, we all interact with voltages, currents, and resistances. They all come together to be known as Ohm's Law. A lot of the time, we can stick with low voltage sources, like 5 volts for digital logic or 3.3 volts for 32-bit microcontrollers. However, some of the time we need higher voltages, higher than even a 9 volt or 12 volt battery can give us, and that's where boost converters come into play. They allow us to efficiently take a low DC voltage and boost it up to a higher DC voltage, making it suitable to run higher voltage circuits like audio amplifiers off of low voltage sources like coin cells or LiPo batteries. If you search online, you will find an endless amount of cheap pre-made boost converter boards, but it is possible to make our own. In this video, we will look at what it takes to make a boost converter and replicate it in our own circuit. Let's get designing. First, let's take a look at classic boost converter theory. This is the basic boost converter circuit that you can find everywhere online. It consists of a coil, a diode, a capacitor, and a switch, which is usually a MOSFET. First, let's understand how the circuit works. When the switch is closed, the coil is connected to ground, allowing the input to charge it up. When the switch is open, the coil will reverse its polarity to keep the current flowing, and therefore, it will then be in series with the voltage source. And we all know what happens when two voltages are in series together. They add up. So the addition of the coil and the input will raise the voltage and charge the capacitor and power the load. When the switch closes again, the coil charges up like before, and the capacitor powers the load. The reason why we have to use a diode is because otherwise, the capacitor will just charge through the switch instead of the load. Anyways, that's how a boost converter works in theory, at least. But now, let's take a look at this pre-made boost converter I found online. It takes an input of at least 5 volts and boosts it up to at most 30 volts. And if we take a quick glance at all the components, we can see the diode, the capacitor, the coil, and an IC. The IC on board is the XL6009 switching DC to DC converter, and it takes care of the switching in the circuit. However, I think we should take apart the board and reverse engineer it to see if it matches with the theory we described earlier. And so, after desoldering most of the components and using the continuity test on my multimeter, I put together a schematic of how it is all connected. And looking at the schematic, it looks about the same, with a few added components. Most notably is the potentiometer. The purpose of the potentiometer is to provide feedback to the IC because different loads will change the voltage output of the converter, but more on that later. To get a better understanding of how the circuit works, we should look at the datasheet to understand how the IC actually works. So, taking a look at the block diagram of the boost converter, we can see how it works. First, it takes the feedback from the potentiometer and compares it to a 1.25 volt reference in the differential op amp. That difference is then given to a comparator's inverting input. The non-inverting input is connected to a ramp oscillator oscillating at 400 kHz. This means that the duty cycle will change based on how much the feedback pin differs from 1.25 volts. This ensures that the output is in fact what you specified on the potentiometer and will stay stable under a changing load. Now that we have extensive knowledge on how boost converters are typically made, we can now construct one of our own. For this converter, I will use this 1N5819 Schottky diode because of its low voltage drop, which is only 600 millivolts at 1 amp. I will also use a 50 volt 10 microfarad capacitor, a logic level IRF Z44N MOSFET, and a 100 microhenry inductor for the coil. After putting these components together on a breadboard, we already have the basic structure for a boost converter. Then, I connected the MOSFET to my function generator, which is generating a square wave with a duty cycle 50% at 50 kHz. And we can see that we are generating a voltage much larger than 5 volts, and adjusting the duty cycle will cause the voltage to increase or decrease. I saw voltages as high as 40 volts on the output of the circuit. However, this circuit still has one major problem. It doesn't have feedback like we described earlier, so it will fail under a load. To fix that, we have two options, either analog or digital feedback. I was originally planning on making this analog, but I did not have suitable op amps at the time of recording the video, so it had to be digital. In this case, we'll have to use a microcontroller, and this time it will be an ATtiny85 because it is what I had lying around, but any microcontroller with an analog comparator and PWM capability will work. So I added the microcontroller to the circuit and connected the output of the boost converter to ADC2 through a resistor divider made up of a 1.5k resistor, a 10k potentiometer, and a 1k resistor. This will allow us to adjust how much the voltage is divided before it reaches the microcontroller. I also added two more Schottky diodes connected to the VCC and ground acting as a voltage clamp to protect the microcontroller from any accidental high voltages through the divider. 
I also added a reference voltage of 2.5 volts to AN0 by making a resistor divider from two 5.1K resistors. And finally, I added a green LED to PB2 so that we can see when the duty cycle is either increasing or decreasing. Now I know I just mentioned a lot of connections, so if you are still confused, you can check the link in the description to get a schematic so that you can understand what is going on in the circuit. Now I can explain the basics of the code in the microcontroller. To start, we can generate a PWM output on the OC0B pin by using timer 0 and fast PWM mode. Basically, OC0B will always be high when the timer overflows. Then, when it reaches the value kept in OCR0B, it will switch to low. That allows us to make a variable PWM duty cycle, but we still have the same problem as a function generator. So we can now use the analog comparator to give ourselves feedback. Whenever the voltage divider is higher than the 2.5 volt reference on the AN0 pin, the duty cycle will decrease, and it will increase if the voltage is higher than 2.5 volts. Again, the green LED shows us when the duty cycle is changing. If you are still confused about the code, you can review the entire file from the link in the description. Now, while the circuit does produce the results that I was expecting, the breadboard really is making it difficult to make anything consistent. So that means it is time to solder it all together on our prototyping board. And so after selecting a prototyping board and soldering it all together, I can say that this is the best looking board I've made so far. But anyways, let's test its performance. We can see that its highest voltage it can reach is 40 volts. However, the multimeter also shows just how unstable it is, changing by several volts. All in all, I would recommend that you do build a circuit like this so that you can learn how a boost converter works. And it also leaves you with a cool looking finished product. However, its high ripple is not suitable for actual use, so I would recommend another solution, such as using a dedicated boost converter IC, or just buying a board outright if you plan to use this on anything serious. Thanks for watching this video, and if you found it helpful, please consider subscribing so you can see more of my videos. Have a good one!